Jesus' name, amen. All right, so David and I were talking yesterday. We had a great talk. It was good. Um, I don't know quite how we got on it, but he just, he just said, what happens, Dad, when, when it speaks of God forming us in the womb? What's he talking about? And I was like, oh, he's got a God question. I'm like, all right, let's talk. So um, we talked for a little bit. But one of the things that, that, that we talked about that happens in that place is, is God puts giftings and purpose into us. He knows where we're going to come out in the kingdom. And, and he, I believe he puts things in us and in there that will kind of be things that call us toward him. And when we find him, these are things that are released. Um, one of the things that I realized about me is that, that, that passion for outreach that he's placed within me. And kind of the purpose to me is take what I learn here, right? Well, what's taught to me here and take it out into the world and cause trouble for the enemy. That's, that's kind of one of the things I see just a, a backbone of my life. Um, wreak some havoc on the enemy's schemes, destroy some strongholds, present the gospel, and bring comfort and compassion to the suffering. And when I get to preach, I feel this inside of me, that the time that we spend gathering here, being taught the word, allowing the gospel to transform us, would be played out out there that's my passion that when i teach you're getting something that you can take out there and wreak havoc so in our homes in our neighborhoods even in our cities that's why i'm passionate so much about second sunday when we as a body get to go out to cut but I feel, and, and a few of us have been discussing this, I feel that we're not fully releasing ourselves, right, when we get that opportunity, our full talent and gifting when we do. So I hope to address that in more detail in the coming months, but it will definitely flavor today's message. So I've been allowed today what we call a one-off. Um, no set subject, my pick. And the very first time I got to preach, I, I remember opening that sermon with, uh-oh, <laughs> y'all pray. They're letting me speak about whatever I want to. Um, and all I really did at that time is just share what was going on in my heart. When I sit down with the Lord, and I'm like, what do you want to talk about? He goes, well, let's talk about what we've been talking about. And back at that time, I was having a real hard time with all the people that I saw that were friends and so forth on Facebook that were caught up in the fray of the world, whatever the things are of the world that we want to throw our opinion on. And, but what we were doing, what I saw a lot of us doing at that time was addressing a subject but attacking a person. And, and we would tear that person down in the process of giving our opinion because that person stood in opposition to us. So that very first sermon was what was on my heart, and that's what you're going to get today. But it's not that subject. <laughs> so, um, so here's what we've been talking about lately, and that is basically suffering, sin, and evil. It's been building up actually for a few years now, but we're really deep into it at the moment. Um, it started with this angst and this frustration I was feeling from the suffering that I was seeing all around me in the world. You may remember a while back I went through a real rough patch for a couple of months. Uh, I talked about it a little, but not in detail, because I didn't want to unpack to anybody what I was feeling, because I was fighting with the Lord, and I didn't want to put anybody in that thought pattern with my mind so confused where it was. But um, I, was, I was really wrestling and kind of walking through a desert at that time. And I kept experiencing all this suffering and this evil at cut, right? Just hearing the stories over and over again in the prayer circle, sitting down with people before service and listening to what's going on in their life just really tore at me the way the enemy 
runs his schemes into people's lives to do that to them. And then I think there was just, I think people arrive at this place, you want to blame somebody for that. And sometimes the issue is so big, all you can do is blame God. Like you got nobody else left to throw that at. You're like, you get to this place in your heart where you're like, why aren't you doing something? So something in me, something in me wanted to lay this at God's feet. And I kept arriving at this conclusion that you, God, are responsible for this. Right? Because I couldn't blame anybody else. But that conclusion was so against what I understood of God. Here's what I couldn't get past, right? You created all this from nothing. So either evil existed before creation and came in alongside him in its existence, like when existence was created, either evil was there and came in, or you allowed this somehow because the word says you know the end from the beginning. It's your will and your purpose that's moving forward. And you're omniscient. I don't know if I said that right. You're omnipotent. I mean, you're all powerful. You have the power to stop anything, anytime. So this has to be on you. I believe at that time, since I was trying to lay blame and my seeking was frustrated by my motive. Right? I did. I wasn't coming at it with the right heart. I think it was the right issue, right? It was the right question. This is a good question to take to God when you're in this place. He says, bring it all to me. So I was bringing some ugly to him, right? So I don't think he was scared by that. But here's the thing. God turns everything to good. We just sang that. We just sang that. And he did with this. So what I'm going to share today are the things that we've discussed and what he has shown me so far about this, because I'm in a much better place than I was back then. And there was even new revelation, even as I was putting this message together, as I started writing this thing out, God's like showing me new stuff and adding to it. So in no way, let me clarify this, in no way do I consider this a complete explanation on suffering and evil. Okay, let's just be clear on that. I'm just going to talk to you guys today about what God's been talking to me about. But here's what I know. I know there's treasure in this. Right? I, I, to stir your affections toward him. In fact, many of you, I think, can add to my understanding. And I encourage you to do so. All right? Um, honestly... On any message we give from up here, your input on what you may have received would be encouraging to us teachers. So I encourage you to hit me with your thoughts, with your questions, and especially your testimonies. All right, because here's the thing. Right now, this is a current truth. I'm not walking in much personal suffering. All right, my life lately has been good for I don't know how long now, but it's like long enough that I have to search for when I really suffered last. Um, and I believe that's mainly due to my growth in God. Just that, that the more I understand about him, the more he reveals about himself, and the more that I believe that and trust in that, that I just walk in this peace. And, and there's probably things going on in my life that should, right, should with the normal person bring me into a place of suffering, but it's just not happening. But this is all being stirred by empathy, compassion, and battle in the lives around me. Like I said, especially at Cut, that's where I feel it the most. Where I take on a role of leader and a covering as I teach. Um, I, just, I just realized this as I said that. I don't get that here. When I teach here, I, I'm not exhausted afterwards. And I think that's because of the body that I'm teaching to. You guys are mature enough. There's less, I think, that we bring in here than the audience that cut. And the war 
that is going on while we teach it cut compared to the battles that are taking place in here. But there are Sundays after teaching at cut where I feel physically beat up. Like I've held a great weight for a long time and I ache from it. Not only physically, but spiritually. So I'm feeling other suffering definitely more than I'm feeling myself. And, but here's the cool thing. Genesis is revealing some walls that I have put up in my life to help with that. Right, Like I've erected walls that keep me from suffering. We identified a, um, a good one here in our last lesson. Um, we've been unpacking this, this idea of the lack of intimacy that we have um, in our lives for other people. And I'll just go ahead and confess this one to you guys if you ever have felt like I'm cold and distant and maybe not as loving or interested that'd be a good word that I'm not as interested um, I think that we've discovered that's a wall that's a wall that I have erected to keep people from being able to hurt me and so some of these walls aren't for good <laughs> So these are things that we were looking for the root of, and this is the beauty of Genesis, pulling that out. So your experiences and your testimonies that relate to this message would be valued. All right, let's get after it. That was the intro. All right, so bear in mind, I just want to re remind you, bear in mind some of this message is the journey that I have taken in my mind with Papa as we've gone through this. So let me unpack my thoughts in full before you start jumping to conclusions. Because I'm going to say a couple of things that will probably be like, oh, that's not true. Right? Let it unpack. <laughs> okay? Um, or I think we'll miss some of the truths that God has for us today. So here's the big one you have to let me unpack. God is responsible for evil. That's what I was wrestling with. And the conclusion I've come to is yes. Because ultimately, God is responsible for everything. All right? He is creator. He started with nothing but a thought and a plan. Logos. We think logos is, is it's defined as the word. But to have a word, you have to have a thought behind it. And that's where everything started. All of creation started in those thoughts of God. And all that exists is by his word. Um, so we read of the lamb that was slain before the foundation. God was answering the effects of evil and sin before evil and sin even existed. Now, if he had that understanding and created anyways, then everything that exists is ultimately his responsibility and his allowance for its existence. But then how do we reconcile that? Now, that was the hard part. How do we reconcile that with God being good, righteous, pure, and holy? How do you match that together? Because that's what's, if, if I said that and you were like something in you went, absolutely not, Mike. God, God does not cause evil, right? Because that's this thing you got to reconcile if possible. And that's really where I was stuck, but I hadn't gotten to that root yet. Can I worship a God that is responsible for evil and suffering? And that's why I was finding it so hard to worship through that time. I, I was finding it hard to draw close to him because I was wrestling with that thought. Um, so the question is, is God responsible? And the answer is yes and no. All right? Yes, because God created a universe where, or let me put it this way. God created a universe where evil did not exist. All right? When he created, it was all good. As he goes through the days, he keeps telling us it's good. But creation had room in the design for evil to come into existence. And it did. But it came into existence through choice. 
right? That's, that's the big thing we got to catch. It's here through choice, um, through free will. And, and if, if we value our free will, right? I mean, and, and I know you know this, and I'm probably just repeating something you know, but without free will, without free will, the concept of love is lost, right? The concept of understanding a loving God or being able to love God would not exist. We would just do it because we were robots. So if you value, if you value that part of your existence and the basis of who we are, then with that comes a consequence, right? It's just, it's in the design. If we get the right to choose, then we can choose no. And we can choose yes. First, given to the angels. Right? Before it was given to us, that choice was given to the angels. For evil's existence to me seems to spring forth as Lucifer chooses not to obey God. Not to worship God. But to be wanting to be worshipped himself. And, and that is to me the first sin. And that's where evil was born. Right? And then Lucifer never changed his mind. He's still running around the world in the same way. The word tells us that Lucifer and his followers are cast down to earth and are here when men and women are created. Right? So creation was good. The garden is good. When man and woman are put into the garden, they're good. But Lucifer's out there running around. The word also tells us that there is a tree in that garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God's command is not to eat of this tree. And until they do, I do not believe that Adam or Eve had any knowledge of what evil was. What sin was. They just had no clue. But as soon as they ate from the tree, when they choose to eat... Their eyes are open to evil, to sin, to choosing not to follow God's will. And because of that, they are cursed. For now, sin has entered the world of man, and suffering is born. We see in Genesis 3, uh, basically in 16 through 19, the, dec the decree that God gives that life's going to be hard. All right? I, I want to refer you guys... If you get a chance after this, I can put the link out. Matt Chandler just taught a sermon a couple of weeks back, and he called it Suffering is Suffering's Normal and God is Good. And if you get a chance, that message will piggyback off of this one so good and, and just give you a, a, such a clearer picture. Um, but we see here in this <laughs> kind of where he's pulling that from. Suffering is going to be normal. All the days of your life will be hard until you return to the dirt. Now, our culture, I believe, especially this Western culture, this American culture, um, through the enemy's schemes, playing this out ever since this country was established, tries to sell us the contrary, this illusion. You deserve happiness and ease. I, I saw a Christian friend post the other day on Facebook that I deserve something that had to do with God. And, and I, I asked, I said, why? She never answered. But I was like, why? Why do you deserve that? And we will walk, we're going to walk in the tension between these two ideas. This just living in America, living in this society. We're going to walk in this tension between the truth of God, and, and what our culture is trying to sell us. Now, the truth revealed to me so far. Oh, wait. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. So if God is good and his purpose and his will is good, why does the design allow for evil, sin, and suffering? All right, so if we're going to say you're responsible, if we go at it with a heart that says you're to blame for all this, we're never going to get anywhere. But if we see that, that it's a reality, right, that he does allow it, 
and, and he knew what was going to happen before he, he said anything, then why? Why, Lord? Why do you allow this? The truth revealed to me so far in these things is that these things should push us toward God. Right? This Again, I want to highlight this because this is what the Lord, un- I was trying to say up here in the beginning, your river runs with love for me. If everything you do is good, everything you do is pure and righteous, then what is it about this that's, that's holy and, and this? And the idea is that as we go through these things, one of two things are going to happen. I'm going to say this in a little bit, but when, when it happened to Job, he had two choices, curse God or praise God. And, and if we go down this path, that when it's hard, and, and I've seen some beautiful examples of this in this body, then when we go down these paths and we go toward God, that it pushes us into that sweet spot. Nothing pushes us into that sweet spot like coming to him in that way. As we seek forgiveness, as we seek comfort, and we seek peace and understanding. For is there anything greater in our existence than that sweet spot, than the love that we experience in the presence of God? And is there any greater hope than eternity? I want to share nine truths today that I've learned about suffering and how suffering should drive us toward our loving Father. Now, each one of these, I think, could be a sermon unto themselves, but I'm just going to hit them briefly, kind of get them in there as little seeds for you to, you to, to stir your affections. Um, so, number one, suffering is a consequence of sin. Now, we already unpacked this when, when we were talking about Genesis 3. I'll show you another verse that speaks about it, Romans 5, verse 12. And I don't think I really need to expand this concept. This is, I think, for this room, this is basic Christianity. So I'm going to move quickly on. Um, The next truth. Evil, sin, and suffering should cause within us a deep dissatisfaction with this world. And it should instill in us a hope and a longing for eternity with God. Right? This is where I started. This is, this is what started in me. Deeply dissatisfied with this fallen world. Deeply dissatisfied with the pain I was seeing in people's life and the effects of the enemy upon them. And like Paul, I felt to die as gain. Lord, just get me out of here. Right? I mean, there's some people here I love, but if you want to call me home, um, I, I would prefer it. But if I must stay, Christ. As hard as life is sometimes, we have Christ in us, our hope of glory. And my soul hurts, hurts for the lost, thinking how they must live without Christ in their suffering. I mean, I know what it is when when I suffer and it draws me to the Lord. I can't imagine... I, I can't even remember what it was like to, to suffer without him. And I, and I thank him for that. Thank you, Papa. I just realized I, just, that's a hard thing I have in my mind to be able to go back and remember. And I'm glad he's taken that away. But that's the weight of cut of church under the tree. And that's what we have the opportunity to bring each month when we visit There is hope that we can share, a prayer that we can offer, an ear that we can lend to their suffering. And it begins with something as simple as, hey, I'm Mike. Walk up to somebody. Hey, I'm Mike. Um, I'm part of the team here. Um, What's your name? You know, how was your week? How was your week? Is there anything you need? Or something that I can pray with you for. That's it. It may feel awkward, but 
I think, I think like most things in life, everything's awkward the first time we try it. The first couple of times we do it, it becomes easier and easier and easier. All right, number three. Suffering is a tool for sanctification. And I think nothing forces us to confront our true selves like suffering. Man, when we're going through it, we look. We look in there and go, what the one's wrong in there that keeps me in this place? Can I get an amen from the people in the Genesis groups? Yeah? All right. <laughs> um, secondly, it forces our focus inward to face that which we ignore, which is kind of saying the same thing in a different way. Romans 5, 3 through 5 unpacks it like this, and we've got a song that we sing about this. Um, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And this is the word. This is what we should be able to do. And I think, though, this takes a renewing of the mind. Because right? this is where I see culture's got us. Because when we start to suffer, do we rejoice? Is that our first instinct? I mean, honestly, which one of you ever started to suffer something and gone, all right, <laughs> this is going to come out good in the end? But it's like a truth we've put in here that, that we believe because the word says it, but we seem not to be able to act on it when we start going through it. So I, I believe there's got to be this renewing of the mind that's got to happen to get us to that place. We've been convinced that suffering is bad because it's unpleasant and, and even painful. But this scripture is trying to take us past the pain to focus on what is coming from it. So, great example. I know you ladies will relate. Much like childbirth, you know this is going to be horrible, right? But it's going to be beautiful at the same time, right? There's going to be something at the end of all this pain and suffering that's going to be worth it all. And we can take that, we can take that into childbirth and, and, and grab that and own that and go through it and it gives us purpose and it gives us strength to get through this thing. We can apply that same thing if we can renew our minds this way. And here God lays it out like this. Knowing that, I'm sorry, this wasn't the one the song was about, it's coming up. But here's what God says. He says, knowing that suffering will produce endurance. All right, as we go through stuff, it makes us stronger. If I survive this, whatever didn't kill me makes me stronger, right? So every time we suffer and go through something, it is producing endurance in us. All right, whether we take it to God or whether we don't, that's just a truth. If you make it through, you are stronger. But endurance, as you do that, it builds character. I remember saying this to David yesterday. I'm like, man, you've seen people who have gone through a lot. Don't they have character, right? Aren't they different from just people who are, who are having an average life? Those who've suffered, they have this character to them. And character produces hope. And that was the thing that I think is the, one of the, like we said in, in one of the other truths, was that this hope that this gets better. Right, that I can get out of this fallen world and there's going to be this, this little blink of time, right? this little blink of time that means so much to me, but in the concept of how long I'm really going to live, right? that'd be like complaining about one second in your day that was bad. It's that hope that the entire rest of the day is going to be wonderful. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the sufferings push us toward God where he pours his love into our hearts, the sweet spot. And we grow in endurance, character, and hope along the way. Those are things I know I want to grow in. I believe this is what Papa is up to in these discussions we're having about this. He's renewing my mind on how I look at suffering. 
I think he's strengthening, <laughs> just revelation as I talk, he's strengthening me to do the job he's given me at Cut, right? Because Cut, Cut's beating me up. That's what started this. And then he's, he's taking me through this, I think, to show me and to renew my mind so that I can face the suffering from a different place. All right, pick number four. Suffering is also a test of faith. Now, Nate hit this subject in depth last week, so I'm not going to hit it much harder. But I want today I want to look at it specifically in being tested in suffering because that's not what Nate hit last week. He didn't bring in the suffering part of it. He brought in testing. So first, um, suffering is a crucible by which we find our center and demonstrate the truth of our faith to the world. All right? So as we, as we go through this suffering, it's like a crucible, and it forms us, right? But in that, we find our center. We find we have endurance. We find we have character. We come out with hope. And then we're able to demonstrate the truth of our faith to the world and how we live. We, Christianity stands against the world and kind of, I think the world looks at us as a hindrance to, to their idea of utopia, right? That, that all these freedoms that I want to pursue, everything that I should be entitled to because I live here in America, you guys stand in our way, right? You, you're in this archaic religion that has these rules that, you know, I, I should, it should only be man and woman, I, I can't dispose of my children if I don't want them. All these little rules that get in the way of them doing what they want. And I don't even think we have to open our mouths to be that witness. The way we live our lives models for them. And, and, and there's a scripture, I can't remember where it's at, but it, to paraphrase it, it says something like this. John, maybe you can help me with this. You're, the world wants us to join in on their orgies and their debauchery and everything like that. And when we say no, it insults them. Do you know where that is that I'm talking about? Okay. Yes, that's it. That we put, there you go, we put off an aroma. Yes. That's exactly it. So I was paraphrasing and thinking it was the scripture, but it is that we put off an aroma that the world finds offensive. So, okay. Yes. Yes. So here's the thing. As we're pushed toward God, we find our center. We find our true life. We find Christ in us. And we then can live a life that shines into the darkness. And the world bears witness to our attitude towards suffering. In times of intense pain or turmoil, turmoil we cling to what we have placed our hope in. And this is where, where the difference between suffering with Christ and suffering without him. Because as we suffer, we should cling to God. That we should run toward him. And, and there's beauty and comfort and, and strength found in that place that I don't know what these people get. I can't remember what it was like to not have something. Yeah, I can. I can remember when I went through anxiety and, dis, and uh, all that that I just had nothing. It just, it tore me apart every time and left me just rolling, you know, writhing on the ground. Um, 
So we cling to that which we have placed our hope in. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And then in all this, suffering will reveal the quality of our faith. All right. How many of us know someone who has walked away from God when faced with deep suffering? I, I know many people, and oh, I hear it cut all the time. When, when you can dig down to that root, and they're like, I'm mad at God. He took my mom. I used to talk to him all the time. But when my mom was dying, I prayed. I prayed so hard for God to heal her, and he didn't. Ultimately, some fail this test of faith. All right, number five. Suffering is multifaceted. This is where the song comes in. Um, let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. This verse says that we are afflicted in every way. Right? So suffering doesn't just come in one way. It comes in multifaceted ways. Um, we are perplexed. We are persecuted. We are struck down. Suffering comes from a myriad of ways, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But this verse also rejoices in suffering pushing us toward God. For then, right, when we're pushed toward God, for then we are not crushed. We are not driven to despair. We are not forsaken or destroyed. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies, proclaiming hope to the world. All right, six, suffering is a battleground. Where there's suffering, there is a battle for the soul. I mean, the enemy, the enemy knows when you're going through it. And, and that's, that's like, I think I've shared with you all my little analogy I use with the youth. Spotlight goes up in the air and it's like, can they? They all come running for it. There are two ways we can respond to this, as I said earlier, as Job said. We can curse him or we can praise him on that battleground. And this I am reminded of every weekend when we circle up to pray at cut. That time is war. And the battle belongs to him. But I distinctly feel this truth that it is a battleground for their souls. All right, seven. Suffering equips us for ministry. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 7. Paul writes here that God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. Right? That's the river. God pours it into us. We got to pour it out. And here's the thing, guys, that I'm going to challenge you on. If you're living your life right now where God is pouring into you and you don't have somewhere to pour that back out, you're missing. Right? If you're just letting all that come into you and stay, you've got like this pull, but you don't have the current. You don't have it flowing through you. And, and there's this beauty when it's flowing through. That's why you guys get so high when you go down to Mardi Gras. You, you, you're like letting that flow completely. And that's what I feel like. Cut. I just, whoa. When I get up here and preach, whoa. So that was a good noise, wasn't it? <laughs> that's what that sounds like. Whoa. Um, <laughs> let's see, where was I? All right. So that we can comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the church. This is the beauty of the church. Why God set it up this way for us to go out in the world and release him. Dave Pallison puts it this way. He says, when you've passed through your own fiery trials and have found God to be true to what he says, you have real help to offer. You have first-hand experience of both his sustaining grace and his powerful design. He has kept you through pain. He has reshaped you more into his image. What you are experiencing from God, you can give away. 
in increasing measure to others. You are learning both the tenderness and the clarity necessary to help sanctify another person's deepest distress. Each one of us in here has that to offer. We, like I said earlier, we may still be scared to do so, but that is mainly due to lack of experience. And Second Sunday, when we go to cut, offers you a safe place to get real faith experience. All right, eight. Suffering happens in community. Galatians 6, 2 tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is love one another. And we, the current, I believe that within this house, we are good at this. We have said it many times. It's one of the things that we declare that we are good at loving on each other through suffering. The church itself is meant to be a refuge for the sufferer. But I ask you, is church this building? And however you just answered that question in your heart, I then ask you, when a member is hurting, should the church apply the bandage? When a member is down, should the church encourage? When a member is in need, should the church come alongside to help? And is not the church you and me, wherever we go, does the church go? wherever we go. All right, lastly, suffering prepares us for more glory. Let us end the message rolling in the glory, right? Because suffering's never a fun subject to talk about. It's hard. But I, I tried to save the beautiful one for last. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, so we do not lose heart, we run toward God. We do not lose heart, we run toward him. Though our outer self is wasting away. Even, even if we're suffering, even, even if we're suffering unto death, our inner self is still being renewed day by day. Sanctification. And then he says this, and this is the beautiful Beautiful one I want you to walk away with. For this light, momentary affliction. Paul, Paul used some cool words right here. He said this light, momentary affliction. Now that's the renewing of the mind. When you can look at whatever you're going through, it's just this light, momentary, even if it's cancer and you've only got a few days left, it's a light, momentary affliction. I think we choose, we choose in whatever comes against us to decide how awful this is. And, and I think it's going to take some renewing in our minds to be able to go, okay, I've got a couple days left. What can I do in those couple days? It's preparing for us an external weight of glory. So he's using this little contrast here. These little light, nothing things are preparing you for this eternal weight. That's the heavy. The heavy is the hope that it's pushing us toward. Beyond all comparison. Right? You think the sweet spot's sweet? The richness of the love of God. Also, while we were worshiping, I heard, I, I heard the word darts, and it applied to this part right here. Satan, Lucifer now, is kind of like the shot collar in prison. He's been chained up, and, and he's in prison, but he's still sending out the hits, right? But they've lost their power. And, and I like the way that God chose the word that he sends fiery darts at us. That's all they are. They're light affliction. They're darts. He didn't use spears. He didn't use arrows. He could have picked bigger weapons to throw at us. But God's like, 
This will help you to withstand the fiery darts. Because that's all they are. He's locked up. Power's been taken away. Ultimately. The power is in how he convinces us that this is awful. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. That's the key. That's the renewal. Get out of what's going on around us and to us and start looking at that unseen world, that what God's up to in this or what God is about to do with it. Because that's, that's the beautiful thing. I think that'll be in my clothes is that we may be going through it, but he's going to do something with it. He always does. He never just leaves it. Oh, what happens when our, or I'm sorry, for the things that are seen are transient. Again, we're going back to this idea. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that aren't seen are eternal. It's a hard thing to do to kind of get our minds out of, out of our physical frame and the limitations of it and, and take our minds into the eternal spiritual things of God. But oh, what happens when we turn our eyes upon Jesus in all things, even suffering, sin, and evil. All right, I want to close with this thought. As we develop an understanding of suffering, we must become clear that suffering never becomes good. All right? I want you to hear that from this message. I'm not saying suffering is good. Suffering is born out of evil and sin. Right? Even suffering that has nothing to do with the enemy. Tornadoes, earthquakes, you know, natural disasters. But those still come from sin. Those didn't exist in the world before we did that. So no suffering ever is going to become good. Suffering remains evil and in opposition to what God wants from us. Right? And we know this because in heaven it doesn't exist. That, that's one of the promises. No more suffering. No more tears. That stuff's not up here. In the eternal weight of glory, that doesn't exist. But suffering can be redeemed and made purposeful. That's what I was thinking about a minute ago. And, and that's one of the things that we know about God, that whatever was meant for evil... Right? And even natural disaster may not be meant for evil, but you guarantee the devil jumps on it. Right? And in that suffering, he's on it. Right? So even in anything that we go through that, that is suffering, I know God's behind it, ready to turn it to good. But you've got to run that way. You've got to let suffering push you toward him. We must see suffering as a trifold call. To long for a better world, to seek to become a better person, and to live a better witness. 